Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. And welcome to our new digs. As you can see, the look of the Table Podcast has changed. We've moved locations. And uh, this is likely to be our home for a while, so uh, we've got a screen behind us in case we have any visuals, but of course today we won't, Just we're just there just to have fun. But uh, our topic for today is uh, an interesting one from a sociological point of view. It is extended adolescence, which if you hear the phrase, you might go, what in the world is that? But it's dealing with uh, the lengthening of the period it takes for people to fully enter the adult world is basically the way to think about it. The term adolescence itself comes uh, – wasn't really started to be used, didn't start to be used until the early 20th century, 1904 I think is the, is the selected date. And now they're talking about extended adolescence. So whereas before you were thinking about somewhere between the teenage years and very early 20s, now we're extending as late as into the early to mid-30s for this category. And we'll be talking about that in just a second. I have two uh, experts with me here today, uh, Jay Sedwick, who teaches here at Dallas Seminary, and Matt Matlock, who works with with it youth specialties. Did I get that mm-hmm. right? That's correct. Mark Matlock. Mark yeah. Matlock. Yeah, sorry. It's an easy thing. My mom calls me Matt. So okay. It's all right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that, I respond Mark. to either one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, um, so, uh, so tell us about the organization that you work with. Yeah, Youth Specialty has been an organization has been around for for quite a long time since the late '60s, early '70s, really when it started, um, and it was kind of founded to elevate youth ministry in the church. Mm-hmm. And we basically resource youth workers through uh, books and publications, training materials, things like that. But probably what we're known for most are live events where we kind of bring youth workers from a lot of different backgrounds together to discuss how do we help teenagers find and follow Jesus. And so we kind of train and support local youth workers. Well, that sounds exciting. How long have you been doing? Uh, I've been doing it uh, with you specially since 2008. Okay. So, so been there for about five. But I've been connected to the organization to, since 2003. Okay. Well, that's great. And where and where did you do your your training? For for this, uh, for, for me, yeah. uh, well, I wish I could say it was Dallas Theological <laughs> Seminary. Okay. Um, no, I, I attended uh, Biola University, oh, sure. and then from there, um, just literally started traveling and meeting with churches and youth pastors around the country. That's great, and have been doing that for uh, over two decades. Yeah, well, we we, we like Biola here. Uh, I teach there just about every summer, so uh, so it's a it's a great place, and you know, California is a great training ground for youth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. 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 It's a fantastic. Uh, state yeah. to have a university in. Yeah, you know. exactly. Then Jay, how long have you been working in, in with youth work, and how long have you been teaching here at the seminary? Well, I've been I've been doing youth ministry for almost thirty years now, okay. and I've been teaching here at Dallas Seminary for sixteen years. Jay, we look thirty years. Old. I know. How do you I do know. that. Yeah, <laughs> it's the hair color. Yeah, you know. Is that what it is? Uh, it works. <laughs> so let me let me dive in by just re- I want to read a couple of paragraphs from a book that's actually pretty interesting. It's called On the Frontier of Adulthood. Uh, it's edited by Richard Setterston. Uh, Frank Furstenberg and Ruben uh, Rumbaut, I guess is how you pronounce that. It's a University of Chicago Press publication. And uh, here it's here's what it says about extended adolescence, and I'll get your comments on the other end. It says, social timetables tables that were widely observed a half century ago for accomplishing adult transitions no longer apply in the contemporary Western world. Adolescence now occurs earlier than in the past, moved up by the earlier onset of puberty, increasing relevance of peer relationships, and new cultural understandings ad- advanced by child development professionals about age-appropriate autonomy during the early teen years. The invention of middle school, starting as early as the sixth grade, when children are typically 11 or 12, marks the beginning of adolescence, so we're before the teenage years in many ways. Um, that's interesting because I, uh, when I think about the structure of many churches, I'm not sure they necessarily structure themselves uh, that way. We'll talk about that. Mm-hmm. But as the ch- chapters of this book clearly show, the end of adolescence has become a protracted affair. That's really where the changes come in on the other end, al- almost more. Entry into adulthood has become more ambiguous and generally occurs in a gradual, complex, and less uniform fashion. 
It is simply not possible for most young people to achieve economic and psychological autonomy as early as it was a half century ago. That's a very important sentence. Thus, the term adolescence is becoming soci socially and psychologically inexact, including as it does 12-year-olds and 20-something-year-olds who may still be living at home and are economically dependent on parents. There is an inclination to devise expressions like emerging adulthood or the term adolescence – I can barely even say that word uh, – which, which was infelicitously coined by Tyre and other associates in 2002 in a recent Newsweek cover. So that gives you the feel for what we're talking about. I think the term that I've heard most common is extended adolescence, that adolescence has extended itself into the 20s and the early 30s. We're dealing with things like uh, boomerang kids, which I had. Uh, I had a daughter. My oldest daughter went to uh, college, came back got married, worked, and then her family moved in with our family. We didn't just get we didn't just get a child. We got a whole boomerang full. Mm -hmm. uh, we got we got uh, the husband, we got uh, two kids living mm -hmm. with us as well and and we did that for about four and a half years. And that's not unusual. So it's becoming, it's becoming incredibly common. Yeah, yeah, and it's for economic reasons primarily. Is that right? Well, or, I think or, economics are, are a big driving force. And I think it's really important. His last statement about the different terms, uh -huh. I think, are really important. I think boomers, um, the boomer generation, mm -hmm. those who grew up, those who were uh, you know kind of born of the '60s, um, they tend to uh, not born of the '60s, but um, you know were emerging as adults right. in the '60s. Right, but I think. That generation tends to think of extended adolescence, uh -huh. and they see this as a negative thing. Uh -huh. I think that those of us that are squarely in more of the um, the Gen X category uh -huh. of life tend to like and favor the emerging adolescence. Uh -huh. I mean, the emerging adulthood uh -huh. term, uh -huh. because I think what we're seeing is is that there really is a new way of becoming an adult because. Uh -huh. It's not really that you're still an adolescent anymore, right. this group of 20-somethings that are right. going through this period of time. There are defined stages that we're seeing in that as well. So, so I, I t personally tend to favor emerging adulthood okay. because I tend to take a positive spin uh -huh. because I don't see it as this is a, fl a fatal flaw of the generation, but it is economic, social, cultural things that are shaping the way this generation is responding to how they survive and stabilize. And so the suggestion and the implication you're suggesting is with extended adolescence is, is that oh it's you're just extending your teenage years and and you're and you're hesitant to become a full adult. That, right, that's the implication. Right. And there's a neg there's a negative kind of association with that a fear I think that 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 older generations have of oh no, will this generation ever be productive and be able to produce? But when you look at what's going on in the the deep structural change of our society right now, right. how what else should we expect from them, from them? Because they're trying to figure out how do I stabilize? How do I survive. find myself in an environment where yeah. you know it, it's not working for the company and, right. and retiring with the company? That doesn't work anymore. There yeah. are no pensions, and there are no you know this is a whole different universe, and this generation's having to figure it out as they're becoming adults. I don't know that emerging adulthood will be a continuing phenomenon a decade you know, two decades from now, uh -huh. but right now it's what is needed because of just the, the, the deep shifts going on in our, not just in our country, but internationally as well. And Jay, what do you see going on in this area? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark had a lot to say that that was very, very uh, on point. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are um, different perspectives in the in the literature of of whether it's a negative thing or a positive thing. And mm -hmm. I, I echo what Mark said. There's a, a, I would say most of the people that are writing about it and talking about it look at it more negatively than positively. Yeah, because older people tend to write. <laughs> uh, and, well, that's right. Yeah, the people that are writing the textbooks are, are in the a ones different. Had their family yeah, move right. in that's with right. them, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's not a. Yeah, they're, it's like, Dealing with the fact that they're putting food now, on the I table. I want to go on record people. that my daughter living with us was a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> and we really, we it really, actually, it did. It forged some terrific uh, depth of relationship that I think uh, we uh, actually don't have with my other children because they haven't come right. back to live right. with us. I mean, that, that's one of the positive things you can look at. 
yeah. you know, culture, the culture in our country uh, in the past, you know, they're saying 50 years, but mm -hmm. I would I would go even beyond that, mm -hmm. um, 100 years, 150 years ago, where the extended family was a huge part of the raising and rearing of children. And because our society now is so mobile mm -hmm. and mobility provides the opportunity for these children to leave, we've gotten used to that. And now there's kind of a return to more of the of the family staying together. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, I think it's a positive thing where parents and grandparents get to spend more time with their kids and with their grandkids and helping them in terms of their development rather than them, you know, 21 years old and off to the other part of the country right. to try to make it in the world and they're they're floundering and they're having a difficult time where there's stability and there's safety in that family structure that might be there. So that's a positive spin to the fact that there's a lot of these, you know, teenagers or young adults aren't leaving. You know, the failure to launch movie that was so funny and, and different things like that. So I think there's a, there's other ways to positively spin it, but that's just one. Okay, well, just to close the loop here on the history of the term and, and the terminology and, ha and how to talk about it, um, the process started in thinking about adolescence when we had a move really from an agricultural society more to a more urban society. People right. moved in. They, there was industrialization. <laughs> People began to leave their homes to pursue their work, that kind of thing. You didn't just pass it on. You may have passed it on generation, but you may have the, – but the one generation may have established themselves, that kind of thing. And then, and then this elongation, if I can say it this way, this emerging has happened more recently because it's just taking – young people longer to get located. They're marrying later. Mm -hmm. uh, they're taking longer to pursue their education. More people are pursuing education. Right. They're taking longer to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's just the economics of, of doing all that that, that right. appears to be what's well, going and just on. Let me give you – I've got some stats on that that okay. I think are really interesting. So when we think about – you know, making a tra major transition, okay? And we have the percent who have completed a major life transition by 30, mm -hmm. and those life transitions would include leaving home, finishing school, financially independent, getting married, and having a child. Mm -hmm. Okay, for um, it was 77% of females and 65% of males had accomplished that by the age of 30 in 1960. Okay. Looking at that today, and this is this information is given by David Kinneman at the Barna Group. Um, when we look at now, it's 46% of women and 31% of men have accomplished those life stages. So this isn't just a, oh, some a little change in the air. I mean, these are mega shifts. Mega these shifts. are mega shifts. Yeah. You know, when you consider 1965% of live pregnancies were to unmarried women, and now it's 41%. I mean, that's that is dramatic shift culturally right. Right. you know the the decline of of, of marriages mm -hmm. you know and the rise of cohabitation those are really strong shifts as it comes right. to development and what that does for ministry that's thinking about and that's usually built around the idea of family and family support that, that cr creates all kinds of interesting pressures on well ministry. the church is a social structure you're right there's the there's the theological understanding of what a church is and then there's right. what it becomes in society right as a social institution and I think it, it, what it stands for right now is conventionality. Mm -hmm. And right now, you have a generation that's going, if something's conventional, it's a kiss of death. I can't survive that way. Uh -huh. Now, it doesn't mean that the church is bad. Right. It just means that what it stands for in its current expression and culture is not necessarily helpful to what a generation needs, you know, or at least their perception of that. Yeah. So it's a, it, it so it's at, so there are new hurdles, is what that. There's some for really sure. new ways of thinking yeah. about things. Yeah. yeah that are yeah. really really challenging. I yeah. Think. yeah. Okay. Well, I thought I wanted to set the stage because I think this is an imp important conversation. I actually think it's something that m that many people and even churches don't think enough about in terms of what's going on socially and how that impacts that age group. And of course, in the background of the, our reason for discussing uh, emerging adolescence in emerging adulthood is because uh, we are wrestling with what's happening to this age group in relationship to the church. So that's the second piece. Okay, mm -hmm. so we've got the this category of what's happening as a way of describing socially what's taking place and what's happening. How is that actually impacting the church? What is happening with young people in the church in this age group? 
Wow. Um, well, if I can backtrack just a, just no a second. Sure. Um, the whole concept of adolescence as a as a, uh, a term, like you said, you referenced yeah. 1904. G. Yeah. Stanley Hall's book Adolescence kind of launched the study of this of this time of life. Mm-hmm. It's really a Western cultural phenomenon. Mm-hmm. We in fact created adolescence, mm-hmm. and people say, "Wait a minute, we haven't we all no? Well, we've always had teenagers." Yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but but many people believe that the Western culture created adolescence. Mm-hmm. This time uh, of life, where you're you're not really a, a child any longer, you're not really an adult any longer. Many cultures of the world had rites of passage where you went from childhood to adulthood Isn't rather quickly. Yeah, uh, yeah. And now we've decided through several things that happened uh, at the beginning of the 20th century with the passage of child labor laws and juvenile delinquency laws and mandatory public schooling that we've created this period of time where where children were like, where, what am I? What am I really supposed to be? How do I fit in? What's my role in this world? What's my, what's my role in this family? In this society and we've kind of set them on the shelf where they can just kind of ruminate for a few years well that has gotten longer and longer like we've called uh, extended adolescence and that, and attack onto it Daryl's you know observation about or, or maybe it was yours Jay's about extended uh, family yes. and community <laughs> breaking right, down right correct Correct. You know, you, you know, you look at a primitive culture or a culture that we call tribal culture or whatever label you want to put on it. But, you know, like you go back to like something like a bride price or whatever. Right. The whole idea there was that as I'm becoming a man, I have to now go to I, to, to get married. It's going to cost me money. Mm-hmm. So I got to go to people. Well, people know that for a long time. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I got I don't have. I don't have the money as a young person to do this. So I've got to go to my uncles. I've got to go to other people in the village. I've got to get them to like help me. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, how many sheep are you going to give me? How much? What are you going to give me so that I can afford to? to so it required the whole community to be involved in that marriage process. And if they couldn't pull it together, it was a way of well. You know, somebody's going to hold back some goats so that they don't let this happen, right? And we actually see <laughs> you know? vestiges of that when we get married today, because when you supply gifts to a married couple, the variety of gifts, et cetera, you actually help them establish They're their home. home. I mean, I wouldn't have had a couch to sit in had it, not, had it not been going on. I would not have had this Waterford crystal duck if I hadn't gotten married. <laughs> I don't want to go there. Yeah, they don't let you return that <laughs> stuff anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, there's a, there, from a historical perspective, um, there's a great book by – um, Mark Center called "When God Shows Up," where he kind of co- he chronologically covers the emergence of youth ministry mm-hmm. and the way youth the youth movement started in the late 1800s and then on it and through uh, the 20th century and and kind of carries it through to where we are today, where there wasn't really a lot of focus on specific ministry to teenagers mm-hmm. to this adolescent period. But over the last 50 years specifically, mm-hmm. a lot of effort and a lot of time spent trying to reach and work with and disciple teenagers, uh, or adolescents as we call them. Which comes and, to the core of even YS's existence. Exactly. You know what I mean? Right. It used to be, you know, all these things happen in Christian Endeavor groups right. or Young right. Life or Youth for Christ, and the church has kind of worked alongside. and. YS, the founders there, you know, they, along with a whole other little collection of... Now, that's of youth specialties. Youth specialties, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, um, you know, they, they, along with a bunch of other kind of, you know, f- pioneers of youth ministry got together and were like, let's call people to be youth ministers for life, yeah. you know, and we're just now seeing that group kind of come of age. So it's an interesting... Well, you know, the, the, I, I don't want to spend our time on history too much, but, yeah. the, but this is actually an important we discussion. We, yeah. You know, we've got this family-oriented church that's trying to minister to people. You had things like Young Life, Campus Crusade, um, Youth for Christ, these organizations that said, well, you know, the church isn't quite getting the job done anymore if we're really going to re- – particularly with regard to outreach. If we're going to do that, we're going to have to go where the kids are. So you had that uh, emerging. Then you had this, sh- this attention to youth. And the thing that I'm raising – and this is why we're doing the podcast mm-hmm. – the thing that I'm raising and the reason I want to talk about this group is, one, we are seemingly losing many – uh, many of this age group, once they make the decision about whether they're going to stay involved with the church, that's mm-hmm. part one. But part two is we're also configured in such a way that our ability to connect with this group is struggling, um, not just because kids move out and they go to college, but because because of the length of the arrangements in our in a, in most churches, at least the church that I that I attend. 
one of them is uh, uh, is uh, has struggled with this area because they aren't located near a college campus, mm-hmm. and uh, they are located sort of close to a community college, but that's kind of a different experience than a university where you've got dorms and that kind of stuff. And so they have wrestled with what to do with this age group, and because the kids that have been raised up in the church go to college and go off somewhere else. They generally haven't been coming back, and so they've lost the ones that they've nurtured uh, just by the sheer geography of what it is the children have done. So so there's this kind of double disconnect is what I guess what I'm raising here in terms of, of how to pursue youth ministry, and particularly um, uh, outreach and availability in such a way that when a person does move into your area where your church is ministering, you, you have the opportunity to capture back some of those who've come from somewhere else. So is that a good overview of the kind of the problem? Yeah, I think those are some of the challenges that, you know, church I think, you know, a big thing is is how do I meet the needs of parents mm-hmm. um, that have kids in this emerging adulthood, extended adolescent mm-hmm. kind of phase of life. Um, you know, a lot of parents thought their job was going to be done once their kids went to college and they go out of college and they would be in the workforce and now they're not. And you experience that too. Well, right. You know, you, we have a we have a whole generation of parents that don't know how to parent right now. And by that, you mean parent their old their older parent, they're, kids. Parent their twenty. They're independent older kids. Yes, yes, yeah, right. yes. Independent. Yeah, yes. You know, uh, Jeff Arnett, who's one of the a leading thinker in this area of emerging adult. I think he may have even been one of the people who coined the phrase, and mm-hmm. the Newsweek picked it up. Um, but he has a book that just came out in 2013 called "When Will My." Grown up kid grow up, uh-huh. and it's a real practical understanding, you know, for parents trying to figure out how um, how do, how do I help my 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 child? Because we we're I think there's a sense of I don't want to help them be dependent right. on me. I want them to stand on their own. So parents are trying to figure out am I helping or hurting? Right. And so to be able to help them understand the generation and figure out what to do. And I think that's a way, you know, as Jay was mentioning, they're looking, coming back in, they're realizing I need networks. I need, you know, social connections. I need community around me in order to stand on my own. I mean, I was thinking about my own, you know, I left right out of Biola, drove out here to Texas and have lived here ever since. Right. And if it weren't for my church though, getting behind my ministry effort, as a community, you know, sending me checks every mm-hmm. week to keep it going. And so, I, I mean, it would have floundered, you yes. know, in my early infancy of, of, of strength. So I look back and I go, man, my church community was way more significant to me than I realized at that age mm-hmm. for helping me find my vocation and all. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that churches today are helping in that same way because I don't know that they're the same kind of communities that they once were. Well, and, 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 and this is actually another reason why I want to do the podcast because I think there's a mentality also that's involved in this for churches that is a hard transition. And what I mean by that is is I'm I'm going to be guilty of a generalization here. Uh, And that is a lot of churches do their ministry and they think about ministering to families. Uh, I'm I'm thinking about in the main worship service context, ministering Uh to families. They're thinking about an intact family. They're thinking about ministering to those families. And youth ministry is something that happens over here. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. And so yeah. so the amount of thought that a senior pastor gives to how he is contributing in ministry to youth right. is not on the radar screen right. in a significant way. Right. There, and there are a variety of reasons for why that happens. We call that the one-eared Mickey Mouse, the where if you think if you think Mickey of a Mickey Mouse drawing with uh-huh. one ear re- removed and uh-huh. just one ear, uh-huh. that one little ear is the youth ministry that's kind of off to the side and it's just tangentially touching the rest of the life of the church. Right. Because so many churches have made youth ministry kind of a separate part of the church. It's that's not right. integrated into the overall life of the church. And I think that's actually one of the major causes for what's going on in that there's not the kind of real good programming thought in terms of intergenerational programming, and we've separated the teenagers, the the adolescents, from the rest of the life of the church. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, much like we've done in the educational world, right? You know, we we, we send our right. kids off to school, and we expect the school system to do the job that long ago the parents used to do. Well, in the church, we've kind of brought that same perspective in and said, well, we're going to expect the youth minister to or, and whatever people he can, you know twist their arm into working with you, we're going to expect that guy or that lady to do the job of the par- what the parents were supposed to be doing in terms of raising and discipling their own children, and we've kind of farmed it out in, in a way, and that separates them from the community life 
the overall community life of the church, which I think is detrimental. Well, and that's actually part of the point, is, is that when you do that, what you've done is you set yourself up for a departure because the, pers- the, the child or the teenager or even the young 20 has never directly connected to the main body in a way that says, this is, this is my church and they minister and care about me. I'm part of a sideshow over here. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think and I think what's happening. I mean, like a YS, like what we like to think about in terms of where we're at right now is, you know, programming is a product of theological reflection. Mm-hmm. So we are looking for theologically reflective programming mm-hmm. in the way that we're thinking about things. And this is, I think, what's happening right now is, is all of these situations are asking, are requiring us to ask the question: What really is church? Mm-hmm. What really is the body of Christ? What is our ecclesiology mm-hmm. around this? And it's weird anytime that I talk about ecclesiology, because I have a lot of senior pastors go, what exactly is that? And we're as youth ministers, <laughs> we're asking that question. Yeah, right, right. Because because, you know, when you think about it, every social institution looks at a teenager as not yet a child, not an adult. The church By its very nature, if you have received the Holy Spirit, you are a part of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And priesthood of believers. And you are an equal and vital member to the body. Right. Yet that is not how they are treated in the in the the Or even programmed. Or even programmed, because the programming hasn't yet touched on the theological reflection. And what I get concerned about, and Jay kind of alluded to, is there's a sense that, well, my parents are my primary disciples of their teens, which I don't even know that is theologically sound. I know that's part of the process. I know that's kind of what everybody's doing, but I think, like, I'm looking, I have two teenagers right Right. now in my house, and I go, okay, because I am a part of the church, I have responsibilities to my children mm-hmm. that God has given spe- specifically to me. But he's, but he's given the primary task of discipleship to the church mm-hmm. to go into the world and make disciples. Because I'm a part of the church, that, that means well, my children are a great being place to be. Why shouldn't a child be discipled in the church? Sure. I mean, right, you know. right, yeah. right. And, yeah. and, and that's that. But, you know, but when we look at. But when we look at um, you know it, m- what I'm seeing right now in my children's life is that they're they are thriving in their spiritual lives mm-hmm. or str- and struggling mm-hmm. in their spiritual lives too in real ways, not because I'm an awesome parent, but because the larger church is now giving them opportunities not just to attend an event for them their age group, but they're inviting them to be collaborators and co-conspirators in the gospel work mm-hmm. of the church, mm-hmm. and so is there you know the you know, my son wakes up at six in the morning on Sundays and drives to lead worship at the middle school, and he's given amazing amounts of responsibility. Mm-hmm. And you know, a lot of times our churches have to get out of the mentality that the younger people are there just for the gift of helps, but to identify, oh, this person has a gift of teaching, and mm-hmm. this, you know, my church did that for me when I was a young man. I was mm-hmm. given opportunities to spin the wheels with teaching and mm-hmm. speaking, you know, and I got critiqued for it too. Uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't all positive, <laughs> right? Happens. But yeah. but I was given that opportunity to exercise my gifts in the body, and I'm looking at the kids that are making it. Um, through and a lot of it is that they did get opportunity. Someone in the church, an advocate for them, said we need to invest more in this in this person's life. Unfortunately, the rest of the students just got stuck with the program. Mm-hmm. So how do we how do we open up the imagination of our, our our pastors and our leadership, you know, to think how are we including them? Because if they do that, then as they become go through that emerging adulthood, they are informing the church so that it doesn't become stuck in its ways. Yeah, you know, I, 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 your your conversation just stimulates my thinking about my own <laughs> church experience, which is probably – this is probably bad that this is going out on the air, but anyway. <laughs> but they, disclaimer. Yeah, 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 did you yeah, sign a yeah, disclaimer? I, 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 I didn't sign a disclaimer. So anyway, if you don't see this podcast, you know what happened. But anyway. Um, Very careful what we say here. <laughs> but I'm thinking about the service I was in yesterday. Okay, in which the pastor makes an effort to deal with the with I would say the fifth graders and unders. He calls the kids up and he has a he has a children's sermon at the, mm. before he does the main sermon and addresses them. And that's a way of trying of the church's attempt to show we want to make you a part of this community and have you be participants before we send them out to do what they do in what we a place we call the meadow. And so, um, but the teenager. The teenage, the teenagers at our church all sit together on the side pew as a group, okay? Mm-hmm. And we occasionally, in a message, 
jokingly will turn and address the teenagers group when something comes up that might relate to teenagers in a significant way or when we're informing the teenagers of something culturally they would have no clue about because of the difference in generations, that kind of thing. Uh, side show, the, the sideshow image comes to me, the sidebar image comes to me very strongly in thinking about this. Um, but where are they actually engaged? How much of the sermons – and this is another dimension, I think, of the equation. How much of the sermons actually address, have the senior pastor address issues and questions mm -hmm. that they're dealing with, or is that all just handed off to the youth minister? Right. right. One, of the, one of the keys to uh, – one of the things that was identified in the research of why emerging adults are leaving the church is because church isn't relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, they're coming to church, and the things that they're hearing from the pulpit and, and anything else in the education program, it's not, it's not addressing the things that I'm dealing with in life, and, and so why bother? You know, this isn't worth my time. It's not helping me. It's not practical. And so they're leaving. That's one of the reasons that have been, that's been identified. So the pastor is going to have to work, and the education ministry of the church is going to have to work hard at making what they're saying and what they're doing relevant to this generation. And you're talking about in the context of the main programming of what the church is doing, not just on the side. As Absolutely. A target. As a whole, yeah. as a part of the church's thinking, theological thinking, as he was saying, uh, you know, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish in the society today? And it's got to be relevant for this generation, and uh, unfortunately, the perception is that it's not. Right. Okay. Well, and, and teenagers are our greatest source. They ask great questions. I mean, you know, Jay and I, this is, I think, why we love being around this generation mm -hmm. so much, is that they are always challenging us to ask us, why are we doing what we're doing? Right. That may be one of their greatest contributions to the church is the questions that they raise and then our our need to sit there and go, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let me think about that a <laughs> little bit. We've always you know? done it that but, way, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, but, but you know, I think, and I think that's, if, 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 I think that's the generation's biggest criticism is that the church isn't willing to use those words. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. We always have an answer for everything, rather than saying, I'm not sure how to answer that right now, or I'm not sure what to do with this. Well, one of the one of the problems with postmodernism, we haven't brought that word out no, yet. No, but we it, got to, kinda, we got other things kind of under the table. <laughs> Here. Yeah. But one of the problems with postmodernism is the fact that this generation questions, they question everything, and they don't like the, the modernist group, those of us that are in that group, mm -hmm. of always having an answer, always you know, being so dogmatic about mm -hmm. this is the way it is, and and they're rejecting that perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, say, wait a minute, you, you can't possibly have all the answers, mm -hmm. and I question the answers that you're giving me. It does. I don't see it working. I don't see it working yeah, in all these people's messy. lives. Yeah. yeah. And, and so there's a lot of questioning going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, we we're, we're I mean, we've got a societal change. We've got the church disconnect. We've got the influence of postmodernism on kids that are calling them to ask a certain kinds of questions, not necessarily negatively, by the way, right. but very 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 helpfully. Here's another element to go on the table since we're painting such a rosy picture of the situation, <laughs> <laughs> and, that is, and, that, and that is the problem that you have within some youth groups that the experience of the, of the children themselves – now I have in mind now the high schoolers and middle schoolers uh, – is so different because you have some kids who are going to public schools mm -hmm. and you have other kids who are homeschooled, mm -hmm. and that has its own separate dynamic from everything else that we've mentioned. That's yet another feature that 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 is a game changer. I remember, again, I'm based on this on my own experience with my own kids. All three of our kids went to public schools, but the bulk of the Sunday school program at our church was made up of homeschoolers, and and the issues those two groups faced were sociologically so completely different. Mm -hmm that the youth minister really had a juggling act to perform. Right. Yeah. Oh no, it's it's tough. I mean there's and, and I and I think but I think this polarization that you talk about, mm -hmm. I mean it's just it's in our entire culture, right? Mm -hmm. Um where we can now with the internet and bot podcasting and um playlists on our iPods, we can basically control everything that we listen to. And so that's why Fox News and MSNBC are making a profit, mm -hmm. but broadcast news can't can't seem to survive because they're just trying to report the news mm -hmm. fair and balanced without mm -hmm. any spin to it. Mm -hmm. And everybody now wants to listen to be evaluate eva uh, to be affirmed and validated. Yes. So now I only listen to the voices that I want to hear. I want to hear, and yeah. I only you know and. 
you know, I, I just went to a, a, a conference last week that was with a totally different theological spectrum, part of the spectrum than I normally, um, you know, hang out with. And it was just absolutely enriching mm-hmm. to be there, even though I couldn't land in some of the same places that they did on things. It was it was just inspiring, and it stretched me to be in that type of thing. People don't want that anymore. Yeah, everybody just wants to be kind of you know, in in the they the, want to the be vein. comfortable. Yeah, where and, they are. And I think that this creates a challenge. I, what this has to do with uh, with with emerging adulthood, I'm not sure, but but these are the big shifts that well, are going I, on in I, our culture. I, you know? I think the problem that we're dealing with here, and, and what we're trying to paint, and we've spent the first half of our podcast doing this, and I think it's important, is setting up all the different features that are contributing to making the ministry making ministry to this group a real challenge. Mm-hmm. And and there are literally multiple factors, some of which the church seems to be well positioned for and can do something about, but others of which produce disconnects. And we're also trying to explain why is it when uh, – and I've got a statistic here that says um, – this is a study that LifeWay did several years ago now, but, it, but I think it's generally on target in terms of the type of issue that we're dealing with. We're dealing with uh, adults aged 18 to 30, and it says 70 percent of young adults ages 23 to 30 stopped attending church regularly for at least a year between 18 to 22. And then, and then I think they've done subsequent work that says and and forty percent of of that forty percent of that total um, doesn't come back. Yeah. Now that yeah. is that's not that, leakage. That's yeah. hemorrhaging. Yeah, yeah. And there and there used to be a thought that oh they'll leave and eventually they'll come back. Right. And for As a the while, baby did. yeah, that's yeah. Right. Because a lot of people they would leave, they would they would experiment, they would you know find themselves so to speak, but then they got married. And they start having children, and they oh my goodness, they church is that important. Conventional life, exactly. Yeah. And so church then, was a marker of conventionality. And they come back, and they come back. But unfortunately, the statistics are showing us that not as many people are coming back as used to, and, and that's if, a huge issue. And if you think about it, it does, it makes sense. And here's 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 what I mean by this: in the earlier configuration, your period between your being released and your getting married and getting set up was shorter. It was tighter. Right. Okay, so you hadn't been away that long, Correct. and you were re- and you were readjusting once you got married at an earlier age. You've developed the habit now of not being connected over a much more extended mm-hmm. period of time. Almost ten years for many. That's people. right, mm-hmm. and so those habits have changed. You, you, your mm-hmm. habits as, as an adult have been so well established by the time if you're getting married in your th- early thirties that. That now the the rearrangement is a is a much more uh, sociologically and psychologically uh, larger leap, if I can sure. say it that way. Sure. And and I think we underestimate um, how significant that is no. uh, in the equation. Oh, it's in, it's incredibly significant. I mean, the uh, you know when you're when you're looking at. Um, you know, the, and I think this is a really important point to make is that we always have to remember the generational lens that we're looking at and evaluating life through. Mm-hmm. The boomers had one experience. Mm-hmm. Gen Xers had a different experience. There are a lot of commonalities mm-hmm. between them too. Uh, not, that, but there are some unique things that happen during our lifetime changes. Mm-hmm. This generation that's coming up right now is millennial generation, and my son, who's a part of the digitals, so right. Generation Z. Right. That's right. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about. I mean, think about just the the changing nature of life and its existence mm. and the nature of relationships and what is a network and what is a community, That's right? That's right. I mean, what is a friend, right? That's right. Uh, on Facebook, <laughs> right? I, I, well, I remember I mean, the thousands. debate. Yeah. In fact, this debate happens on our campus about you know about online education mm-hmm. and can you do seminary online and that kind of stuff. And I find myself saying to my colleagues that – you know, we had to learn to be digital, okay? Our world was not digital when we started off with. My kids have grown up instinctively being digital. Mm-hmm. They were, they've been digital from them. In fact, they are so digital that my 8-year-old grandson can tell my 60-year-old wife, okay, how to work the equipment, uh, right. you know? <laughs> right. Right. So what we're seeing reverse mentoring. Exactly. Where, where, older, where older people in the workforce are getting a younger mentor right. to help them navigate the technology. certain aspects exactly. of right. life. Right. And, and so the, the, point, the point, again, being that, that, that these relationships that certain ha- ha- 
tended to have a certain dynamic have been reversed. And we can't the, – the, the real point I want to make is you can't reproduce your experience of how you deal with networking, relationships, et cetera, in, with the realities of social media in an online world and equate that to the experience of your child who's had it from the get-go and didn't have to adjust to it. So we say things like – there's no way you can have a personal relationship through this uh, computer. There's just no way. It can't be face to face. Meanwhile, the child says to the parent, I'm in better contact with more of my friends, knowing more what's going on with their life and more engaged with them than you ever have been with the people that you hang out with. And there's a sense in which they're right. Yeah. Yep. But there, there's some research, uh, Rainer and Rainer. <laughs> um, the book, The Millennials, that, uh -huh. they, that they came out with a year ago. Um, it's interesting, though, that you say that, that, that whether or not their research is, is valid or not, I think it's, it's, it's fairly well done. Um, but they're saying that this, this millennial generation is, however, craving true relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, true personal relationship one-on-one -on -one with people, not just through the technology, mm -hmm. but they want community. They want to be around people. That's why so many of these places where, where this age group hangs out are so popular. They want to go be with their friends. They want to spend that time together, and uh, we need to capitalize on that. Yeah, well, there's a, there is a whole pack mentality, if mm -hmm. I can say that, that you see that is also a reflection of, of these kinds. The point here is, and you know, I'm not apologizing for taking this long to paint the picture because I think it's a complex picture and it has lots of different. Well, it's good uh, for people to know. Brushes. It's not simplistic. That's right? exactly yeah. right. No, it's no, a no, very, no very complicated. Talk about where we're at. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lots of books being written. And, and I think that most people have not given thought enough thought to this, and churches in particular, and and I especially church leadership, uh, pastors. Elders, people who do the programming and the structuring of what happens to the church, uh, have not given enough thought to why this is. And they ask, why are why are our kids leaving? There, we we make the effort to teach them. They're, you know, we're preaching the Bible every Sunday. Why, why is this happening? Well, it's happening because there are all these forces that are at work that you really haven't come to grips with, and that you need to come to grips with in order in order to uh, to move forward. Thanks for listening to the Table Podcast. Join us next week for part two. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well. Love well.